Richard Branson. Welcome. Welcome so much. Nice to see you. Nice to you. Thank you very much. Good. All right. And here's Miles. <laughs> all right, sit all right. down, make yourself comfortable. Thank you, David, and thank you all for being here this morning. You just flew in from Las Cruces, <laughs> and boy, are your arms tired. Uh, yeah. you, you had quite a show yesterday. Tell us how it went. Tell us what you were doing at the spaceport in New Mexico. Um, well, it was, uh, yeah, a historic day. We, we just um, uh, finished um, building uh, this, this beautiful looking spaceport right, right out in the, in the middle of the desert. And kind of looks like a stingray. What's that? It looks like a stingray, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, it's well, maybe a stingray. I never thought of that, but, um, but it's, it, it looks, anyway, out of this world, which it should, and it fit, but it fits in really well in the desert, and that's where um, the whole space program is going to be launched from. So, um, uh, how many people put their hands up? <laughs> yeah, who wants to go? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. As long as we've uh, so, stopped... um, Who's your bosses? Can we get your salaries up quick, please? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone needs a raise here, I think. <laughs> so <All right. laughs> I, should, I should tell you, I'm gonna, I've got my uh, Twitter feed open. At Miles O'Brien is my address on Twitter. And if you want to chime in with a question or a comment as we talk here, I'm going to guess this crowd has a lot of portable mobile devices. Safe to say? All very well secured, I'm sure, as well, too. So let's talk about uh, how things are going. You have 455 people on the wait list, maybe 456 or 7 today, who knows, uh, who have put down some money for this. How soon before they get to fly? I know you and your family had planned a, a Christmas 2012 vacation to space. Is that going to happen? I, th I think so. I think we'll be um, finished and ready for next Christmas. And um, my kids have reached an age where they, where they love to experience some of the adventures that I do to, uh, together. So I'm very, very lucky as a father to be able to share, share these kinds of um, wonder, wonderful things with um, Holly and Sam. Um, and then the following year, uh, we should take more people to space uh, in that one year on a you know, commercial spaceship company than NASA and the Russians have taken to space in the last 70 years. So. Um, which well, is, which is I, I know I know you know the number, but we should tell the crowd here that basically in the entire history of the space age, about 50 years or so, only about 500 people have gone to space. Yeah. And your wait list is about that length, right? Yeah, I mean, by the end of this year, it will be 500. So, so uh, and I think our, our real challenge, you know, I mean, the, the, the price these people are paying is not cheap. I mean, they're, 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 they are the pioneers. They're paying a couple hundred thousand dollars to go to space. Um, the, but that's roughly the same price as it costs to cross the Atlantic in a, in a um, Pan Am plane in the 20s. Um, so, and, and they were the pioneers of transatlantic travel. Um, I'm willing to forecast today that uh, the people in this room's children um, you know, 20 years from now, they'll be thinking, you know, will, you know should we go on holiday this year? Or shall we go off into space? I mean, and, and, and that, that, that we'll be able to get the level, you know, the level of uh, the cost down to a level where, you know, uh, many, you know, I mean, m most people's kids here will become astronauts. I mean, it's, it, which is a fantastically exciting thing to, to think about. Well, can you imagine in 1925 talking with somebody who is, you know, flying airmail and saying someday there'll be a jumbo jet that will take you across the ocean? They would think you were crazy. So. This is a, probably a pretty good analogy to where we are in the space program. I guess uh, the, the question is, and I've seen you talk about this a little bit, can you ever see this as becoming a means of transportation, suborbital flights from New York to Tokyo, for example? Is that possible? Yeah, I, I have to hold um, our engineers back um, at the moment. I mean, the, you, know, they, they're every, you know, it's like me. I'm always wanting to move on to the next project, but I'm just saying, look, you know, we've, we've got to finish our space project first. Um, but, I mean, the, the, the whole team of wonderful engineers that work at Virgin Galactic, uh, they believe it will be possible to create spaceships uh, that uh, uh, pop out into space and pop back down. Um, I mean, I'm off to Australia tonight, so uh, it's going to take me 21 hours. Um, you, you know, these engineers say that, you know, they may be able, well be able to do it in, 
you know, so it could t take one and a half hours from, um, you know, from Las Vegas to, to Australia. And, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm very much hoping that they can achieve that in our lifetimes, which would be spectacular. And what a ride. What, what a ride that would be. You, I mean, the, only problem, the only problem is the airport. I mean, by the time you got through security, it's one and a half hours. <laughs> the TSA <laughs> will take longer than the flight. Yeah. <laughs> Let's, um, in September, end of September, you had a glide test. You've had about 16 of them, I think. Um, and that was a real nail biter. It, it, it uh, descended much more steeply than you anticipated. Uh, and in the end, uh, it, it proved how safe the craft is as you were able to feather it and everybody landed safely. Just tell us a little bit about that and give us a little insight into the challenges that you have encountered along the way here. It's a little bit harder than it looks, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we, um, uh, yeah, we're building a, a spaceship program uh, from scratch. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, it, and, and NASA, in building their spaceship program, you know, they had challenges. I mean, um, you know, they lost 3% of their customers, um, generally speaking, at, at the re-entry stage. Um, that's completely unacceptable if you're a commercial spaceship company. We, we, you know, we have to, um, you know, we, can't, we cannot af afford to lose our customers because uh, we may not get new customers. So. Um, so re re return, return t offering return tickets rather than one-way tickets is quite important. <laughs> um, the, um, um, you know, but we have you know, brave, brave uh, test pilots test, um, who you know, are, putting, are putting the aircraft through their paces. And, uh, and in the process, they, you know, they push them to extreme situations. And, uh, you know, they might, you know, might find the aircraft spins out of control because they've, you know, really pushed it. And, um, you know, but the great thing about this spaceship is it, it's got backup mechanisms and it can, you know, uh, and, and all the backup, backup mechanisms have worked. And, um, and I think, you know, by the time we finally fly passengers in, you know, 15 months' time, we would have done many, many flights and many, many flights into space. And, you know, obviously we hope, we hope, um, to, we hope it goes without, without, you know, without, without anybody getting hurt. We have a tweet here. Uh, do you envision space hotels in the near-term future? We have uh, been working on a, um, uh, a Virgin Space Hotel. Uh, the, the, the idea is to build it uh, not on the moon, but just off the moon. Um, and, uh, and there will be these lovely glass pods, which would be your bedrooms, which you would sleep in and <laughs> as you go around the moon. And, uh, and then we'd have little, tiny little spaceships, which where you could go off for a, a day ride around the moon. Uh, and we could so, wait, so this would be the place where you entered the quarter million mile high club. <laughs> and who would get to be first for that? <laughs> they, look, my company's called Virgin. <laughs> <laughs> I see the business opportunity, there is no doubt. <laughs> they, um, okay, this Virgin may go the whole way, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Virgin Galactic, it's crazy, it's wild, outrageous, and it's fun. That's you, isn't it? Yeah, I love to be, I love to be, um, yeah, I think all of us really would, li would li love to be crazy, outrageous, and have fun, and push, you know, push the limits, and, um, and, Life's, life's a lot more fun, you know, when you do that. And, um, and I suppose I'm in, you know, a fairly unique position where I can, you know, set myself these, these fantastic challenges and, um, and, you know, try to make them possible. So, as we said in the introduction, you were not a good student. You're dyslexic. You, you struggled in school. Uh, were it not for that fact, you probably would have stayed in school. And you come from a long line of barristers. You would probably today be a barrister in the city, in bespoke and rather anonymous? Is that possible? Uh, it's certainly possible. I mean, I, I, I quit school at 15. Um, the Vietnamese war was raging. I'm afraid, you know, it was another war that we should never have fought. And I, I wanted to um, start a magazine to campaign against it. Um, you know, even those who started the war, you know, um, when they got into their 80s, um, you know, 
said that they, it was a dreadful mistake that they'd made. Um, and, and so, you know, went, left school to launch a magazine to campaign against, you know, is, issues that I felt strongly about and, you know, managed to pay for the cost of the magazine by um, selling enough advertising to cover the, cover the printing and the paper costs. So man, managed to self-finance it. And it became my education. I mean, just getting, getting out there in the real world and learning the art of survival. Tell us a little bit about, you grew up um, son of a barrister, obviously, and uh, your mother in particular had a, a big impact on you in challenging you. Uh, and that, I think, uh, has a lot to do with uh, the kind of person you, you came to be, obviously. Tell us a little, just give us a couple of anecdotes, or a anecdote, about how your mother, I think in one occasion, sort of left you far from home and made you figure out how to get back, that kind of thing. In, you'd probably be arrested for child abuse these days, but go ahead, explain the story. You just told it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> um, uh, um, my mum, uh, actually, who's with me on this trip, and, uh, and she said, can I, can I come and watch you talk? And I said, look, you, you, you've, heard, you've, heard me, you've heard me talk before. You go and do some shopping. Um, but um, anyway, uh, she, um, uh, yeah, she believed in, you know, bringing us up, you know, not to watch other people doing things, but to do things ourselves. She, she wouldn't let us watch television. You know, we had to be out there um, climbing trees or, you know, just, you know, uh, you know, doing useful things, as she would put it. Um, and yes, she, you know, she was, you know, she, she didn't want to mamby pamby us, as she said, you know, so, yeah, uh, yeah, there was the famous occasion where I was going to my grandmother's house and she pushed me out of the car four miles before I got there. I was about four or five years old and uh, got completely lost and, and, and ended up in a, far, in a farmhouse. And as you say, she definitely would have got arrested today. So, um, <laughs> they, um, but somehow we survived and, um, and I think, you know, we benefited from most of her. Uh, <laughs> most, what? most of her. She was a terrible cook. I, 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 I mean, she was such a bad cook and she would not let us get down until we'd eaten her dreadful food. And, and there, was a, there was a drawer in, on, on, on the table which all the youngians used to go in. And it was only when we moved house that this, this drawer fell open and this moldy <laughs> lot of onions was discovered. <laughs> all the, <laughs> but, the stuff anyway. that wasn't eaten. Do you parent the same way with Sam and Holly? Um, well, my wife won't allow me to try to kill my children. <laughs> 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 Um, I think my wife's a very down-to-earth, uh, working, working-class Glaswegian, um, um, fantastic mum, um, and I think she most likely would, would have been overly protective, and, and so we've, I think, you know, I think they've, they've managed to get a, 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 the right, right sort of balance, and, um, but the kids have now grown up to being, you know, they're going to come to space with me on the first spaceship next, you know, we, we, we went, we did the transatlantic an attempt to be the fastest across the boat in a sailing boat. We're about to kite surf across the English Channel together. So they've got slightly more my side when it comes to the adventure side. In, in the mold. So if they were to come to you, Sam or Holly, and say, I want to fly a balloon around the world or whatever, you'd say, fine. Yeah, I love them. <laughs> I would not want to lose them. But I, I, equally, I think you only live once. And I think you know, you, you, living life to its full is, is good. And, and, you know, obviously I would, just like I do in business, you know, try to protect against the, the downside, try to make, look at all the worst things that can happen, try to make sure that, uh, you know, that we, we, we've thought all the worst things through and that there's backup, you know, there's, there's as many backups as possible. But, um, you know, but I think if you, you know, if you say yes in life, life is far more rewarding than if you say no. In your autobiography, you begin, it's very, it's, it's actually um, very emotional to read as a parent, uh, with a letter that you're writing before your, one of your around the world balloon attempts, a letter you wrote to your kids to be read uh, upon your demise. And it's, it's, you know, any parent reading this would have a hard time with it. I, I suspect you're not the kind of person that is often filled with doubt. Uh, but at that moment, did you think twice? Oh, of course. I mean, it, it, it's, I, I remember actually climb, climbing into one of the balloons and, you know, my 10-year-old son um, suddenly burst into tears and, you know, you're heading off around the world in a balloon, um, you know, across the Atlas Mountains, across Mount Everest, across K2, 
Um, and, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, um, you know, I, I love my children and would, would hate, absolutely have hated it not to have come back. Um, and, um, you know, and, you know, and I'm sure that some parents in the audience will think that, I, that, that one was being slightly selfish to have done it. Um, and that's possibly true. But, um, you know, but I suppose my, you know, my feeling in life is, you know, there, that if things have not been achieved, like, you know, I mean, we were the first to cross the Atlantic in a hot air balloon, and then we were the first to cross the Pacific in a hot air balloon. Um, and then we were determined to be the first to fly around the world in a hot air balloon. We had, you know, magnificent experiences. Um, and, um, and, you know, by developing the technology to do these things, you sometimes find, you know, big breakthroughs come about from trying to push the limits. So um, sometimes they don't, sometimes they do. But, um, but anyway, we did survive. Um, I mean, I was, I think I have the record for being pulled out of the sea the most times by a helicopter, five times. <laughs> uh, and, um, You're a virtual tea bag. <laughs> so, and therefore, therefore, to get to, to say thank you to the, uh, uh, we now sponsor the, uh, ambulance helicopter service in London, so we've, we've, <laughs> we've sort of, sort of, hopefully paid back a bit. I was talking a few years ago to a shuttle astronaut about this this issue that that they're the day they strap into the shuttle, which is you know just the climax of their career, that the, the absolute peak, the, the finest moment of their lives, career-wise, is absolutely the biggest nightmare for their families. You know, there's this dichotomy. That had to be the same for you and your family when you were doing these adventures. Yeah, I'm not sure it was as a big nightmare for my wife. I mean, I think, you know, she would, you know, come on, go. If you, if, Get on with if it. You, if you're going to be stupid enough to go and want to try to kill yourself, just make <laughs> sure that the island is signed over to me before you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, uh, and I, unfortunately, I think in those days, the kids were young enough maybe not to fully realize the, the, the full implications. So... Um, I think now it's, it's really tough for my wife because the kids insist on coming with me on these adventures. And, and um, yeah, that's, that, that, that's not easy for her. All right. Um, I want to talk, move into your, your business career a little bit. But before we do that, there's a, there's a great video which kind of puts it all, the, the virgin story, boils it down into three minutes. So let's watch that and then we'll continue our conversation. Everybody at Virgin love a challenge. I think what Virgin is about is taking on um, big conglomerates and moving into their territory and seeing if we can shake them up. You know, we've managed to do that in the music business, we've managed to do that in the aviation business, in the mobile phone business. And I think that where the people who work for Virgin get their passion from uh, is being proud of the company they work for, being proud of the difference that Virgin's making.
job. I need to change my ticket. We're getting this uncommon service because we rock. What a great video. That's fantastic. You're still having fun, aren't you? I must be older than I thought. I just seeing all that. <laughs> anyway, um, no, look, I, I have an absolute blast. So, um, and um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'd be a sad person if I wasn't having having the greatest greatest fun. Okay, let's go back to Student Magazine. Uh, you've always been ahead of your time. You were ahead of your time in the sense you were losing money in the publishing business. It was student. <laughs> so that led you to the music business. Explain that transition a little bit to people. Well, first of all, I, I, I've never thought of myself as a business person. I've, um, and, and I think, actually, people who think of themselves as business people most likely are not going to be um, that successful. Um, what, you know, what, um, you know, what I, um, throughout my life, what, what I've tried to do uh, is create things for a reason. So, you know, Student Magazine, I started in, in order to have a voice, in order to make a difference. Um, uh, music, I mean, somebody, a, a friend of mine had a tape, um, absolutely loved his music, but re people refused to put it out. He was 15 years old, he played all the instruments himself. So. Um, you know, so I went to the record companies, nobody would put it out, so I decided, well, um, well screw it, let's, you know, let's um, set up our own record company and put it out. Um, and, it, and it actually happened to be very successful. And, um, and, uh, and then since then we started signing other, other, other bands that we liked and we, you know, we built maybe the most successful independent um, record label of its time. Um, and, uh, and you know, particularly excited when we finally signed the Rolling Stones, which was something that I'd... Um, but that wasn't easy, was it, to land I, them? You, you tried to land them several times. I tried, I tried to sign them several times, but um, anyway, don't give up. <laughs> no. um, and I think, you know, just, just throughout my life, um, the businesses that we've set up um, uh, have all come from, you know, maybe frustration. I mean, like, you know, we went into the airline business because you know, I hated the experience of flying on other people's airlines. I felt, you know, I did fly a lot on other people's airlines, and I felt I could create the kind of airline that I'd like to fly on. Uh, you know, great entertainment, great staff, you know, people, you know, cabin crew that actually smiled, et cetera, et cetera. And if I liked it, then other people would like it. And, um, and, uh, and, and that's, you know, every, every, so every move that Virgin's made has often come out of a, a personal, you know, frustration that, Surely that could be done better than it's being done. It's a good thing your first choice for a name for the company did not take, because I think you might not have 455 people waiting to fly on Slipped Disc Galactic. <laughs> so yeah, no, Slipped uh, slip uh, Disc was cute, but Virgin was brilliant, <laughs> right, as a brand. How did that happen? Well, I was 15 years old. <laughs> um, and, um, <laughs> And I was sitting, sitting around in the basement. This is a, really a tell-all, isn't it? Yeah, there were a num number of other young girls. You know, <laughs> uh, let's, let's call them 16. Uh, and um, they... Everything was legal. <laughs> um, and, um, and one of them jokingly said, well, we're, we're all virgins. Uh, why don't, why don't, uh, and, and laughed. <laughs> and why, and said, why don't, why, don't why don't we call the company Virgin? And uh, so it was either, yeah, we, we sort of tossed a coin. It was either going to be Slip Disc Records or Slip Disc Airlines. And, as you rightfully say, slip disk airlines, I think, or oh, slip disk for spaceship companies or whatever, it wouldn't, just wouldn't have worked. Wouldn't have worked so well. No. Tell me a little bit about uh, one, of the, one of the crucial turning points for you in the uh, music business 
was Mike Oldfield and Tubular Bells, which is a classic album from the 70s. If you're of the age, you know it. Um, this might be too young a crowd, I don't know. But um, how important was that, and how difficult was it to build a record label? Because you referred to the Rolling Stones and how difficult it was to land a, uh, that act. It seems to me it's kind of like putting together a sports team. It's hard to get the stars. Yeah, well, we, look, we, you, you do need some lucky breaks in life if you're you know, building businesses from scratch. And, and our lucky break was um, signing Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells, which uh, he was 15, I was 16. Um, and um, and uh, as I said, nobody else would put his music out. We put it, we put it out. Um, and people absolutely loved it. And, and, um, and I think a lot of people got stoned, by, stoned on it. So. Uh, they, they, um, uh, so uh, you know, it and it and Dark Side by the uh, Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd were the two mass, massive sellers of the time, um, and I think you know, fortunately, we you know we took risks. We you know we signed the Sex Pistols at a time when nobody else would touch them, um, and you know we got prosecuted for the name of the album sleeve. Never mind the bollocks. Here's the Sex Pistols. Um, which um, the police decided was the word bollocks was rude. And um, it's quite a funny story, actually. I mean, ob obviously, the police thought the word bollocks was... Uh, but you, you, you actually consulted a linguist to find out what bollocks means, right? Well, the, 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 yeah, the, the lawyer that we got was, said that he would defend us for free because he thought it was ridiculous that they were, they were prosecuting us. And um, uh, a famous QC. Um, and... Um, and he said, look, you know, find a linguistics, that can, a linguistics expert. So I rang Nottingham University, which was the town we were being prosecuted in. And, um, and the professor of linguistics asked, answered the phone. And, um, and I said, you know, could you tell me what the word bollocks means? And they said, well, the police obviously think it's a derivative of balls, but, it, but they're wrong. It's, um, it, the word bollocks is a nickname that was given to priests in the uh, 18th century. Uh, and they talked because, because they talked a load of rubbish. So basically, the, the album means never mind the priests, here's the sex pistols, or never mind um, the rubbish, here's the sex pistols. So, uh, so he said, I said, well, would you mind coming to court? And he said he'd be happy to do so. And, um, and then the punchline came. He said, um, I happen to be a priest myself. Would you like me to wear my dog collar? So, <laughs> so. <laughs> So somehow we got off. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't make that one up. That was, you know, that case dismissed at that case point. That, the, yeah. the gavel comes down. Okay, a lot of us here um, have had bad experiences on airlines, but we don't go out and lease a 747 for a year, which is what you did. Uh, I found it interesting that you uh, got some counsel from Sir Freddie Laker, who pioneered low-cost seats across the Atlantic. And I'm curious, first of all, you didn't do exactly what he did. Um, because obviously it didn't work out in the end for him. Um, but I'm also curious uh, how, who you admire, who you consult. Do you find yourself uh, looking for advice uh, frequently as you engage in, in new business ventures? I, I think the best leaders are, um, are the best list listeners. I think um, you know, people who get out and, uh, you know, um, you know, I mean, People who get out and listen, um, you know, the best, you know, the, 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 you know we're, we've got a wonderful organization of elders that we work with, and they're fantastic listeners. Um, so I'm listening all the time. I'm taking notes all the time. Um, uh, I'm listening in particular from the people who work, work with me, because they, you know, they know what's going on. You know, they know um, the feedback from the customers. Um, you know, if I fly on a Virgin, a Virgin Airline, um, you know, I make sure I don't, you know, sit. I'm up, up and walking about, meeting all the customers, um, meet, meet, meeting all the staff, um, taking notes, um, making sure, you know, that, that the next day I deal with those notes. Um, you know, if, we're, if I'm down route in San Francisco, where I, where I will be tonight, you know, I'll make sure that I go to, go to the same bar that the staff drink at. And, um, you know, by the end of the evening, uh, if I haven't taken those notes, I won't remember the next morning what they told me. <laughs> so, um, but it's, you know, so it's, it's very, very important to be a good listener. You're a delegator 
a listener, and you also have uh, an incredible sense of uh, paying attention to the details of the business. When I say all those three things, it sounds like that's three different people. How do you mix all of that together into a management style? Um, I don't think it need be contradictory. I mean, I, I, you know, from a very early, early age, um, I realized that um, the importance of delegation. So the, mo the moment you've got more than one company, you know, you, you have to learn, you have to delegate. And, um, and it's very important that you find people um, to run your companies who are wonderful motivators of people, who you know, look for the best in people, who praise and don't criticize, um, uh, and you know, who, you know, who, just, who, who just genuinely care about people. And, 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 um, and that's, the, that's the kind of people that you know, run, run the various virgin companies. Um, it's very important that I don't try to second guess those people. I mean, you've got to give them the freedom to make mistakes as well as to make good things. And, um, and you know, hopefully I'm, hopefully I'm good at that. Um, at the same time, you know, if I'm, uh, you know, when, when I'm traveling the world, I do go out and visit all the various virgin companies and I do, you know, make lists of, you know, sometimes quite minute little, deta little things. And, and I think it's, it, it's getting all those little things right um, that make for an exceptional airline or an exceptional health club or an exceptional train company. Or, you know, it, it, uh, it, it, it's the moment management start getting lazy and they let those little things starting slip uh, that you just become a chain of hotels or a, you know, a, a big chain of restaurants. Um, you've got to run your companies as if you are um, you know, in a very personal way and make sure that every, all those little details are sorted. Um, and by sorting all those little details, and um, then you're giving the, your staff the tools to do the job well. Um, your staff can then be proud of the job they're doing. Um, they can be proud of the brand they're working for. They, they can go out in the pubs in the evenings um, and everybody, all their friends uh, are, you know, are, can, are proud of them because they work for that particular company that, that, you know, that, that, that really excels. And, and it, the whole thing is a self-fulfilling self, uh, um, and you know, works well. It's interesting because I, I read a recent opinion piece that you did in the wake of the death of Steve Jobs, who was a famous non-delegator, a person uh, whom you admire. Before we talk about him, uh, you were in a very illustrious group of people a few years back, the famous Think Different um, sick uh, series of commercials that um, um, Apple did. And recently, it came to light that there was a version out there in Steve Jobs' voice, which yeah, I'm surprised they didn't release it that way in the first place. But let's, let's watch it for a second. Here's to the crazy ones the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Must be kind of nice to be among that illustrious group. I'm curious, there's actually a tweet here that plays off this nicely. Simon Cousins tweets, what historical figures have inspired you? Um, I think there's, well, there's two that are alive today that have, um, Nelson Mandela and, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who, um, uh, you know, who, uh, I mean, with Arch, with, with, with um, uh, sorry, with Nelson Mandela, he, you know, he spent 28 years in prison. Um, uh, you know, he uh, is released from prison. Um, he becomes president of um, South Africa. He forgives his captors, 
um, uh, he unites the country by having Archbishop Tutu set up a truth and reconciliation court um, where you know, if people had committed atrocities, instead of them being executed, um, they have to come and apologize to the families of the people they'd committed atrocities to. And in that way, you know, they united South Africa, white and black. It's become one nation, um, one great nation. Um, and they, you know, I've been, had the privilege of working with them on, on, a, on a wonderful project called The Elders, but, um, and getting to know them really well. And they are truly incredible people. And um, perhaps, you know, and to me, the most incredible people on earth today. Um, may they live long lives. Uh, let's go back to Steve Jobs for a minute. You know, for, for every bit of fun you have, he was serious. For every bit of delegation you have, he was maniacal in controlling every aspect of his brand. And yet, the end result is kind of the same in the public's view, that you have a face that is just interwoven with a brand, with, with a tremendous amount of success associated with that. We're, we're just beginning to learn now what uh, the loss of Steve Jobs means to the Apple brand. Will Virgin exist without Richard Branson? Well, it's interesting in the music business, um, when one of our artists died, we found the sales um, you know, multiplied, so hopefully the same will happen at Virgin. <laughs> um, slightly more serious answer. Um, I think that, you know, that Steve Jobs and myself have spent our lifetimes building um, a global brand, um, a brand that, you know, I mean, I set out to build the most respected brand in the world, not necessarily the biggest brand, and, um, and you know, I suspect Apple's ahead of us at the moment, you know, but we, 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 we'll, we'll see how we go. Um, but, um, you know, but, but um, you know, so I think the brand, the, both the Virgin brand, the Apple brand, um, they're brands that stand on their own um, and they, they no longer need uh, the Steve Jobs and the Richard Bransons to, you know, help, help push them forward. Um, uh, uh, I think companies do benefit from having um, front people. Um, and so, you know, uh, at, Virg at Virgin, we'll try to, you know, maybe my, maybe my daughter, maybe my son, maybe somebody else um, will, will take the baton forward um, and be the face of Virgin, because I think, it, I think, it is, I think it's good to have a face. Um, I think people relate to companies that have a face. Um, and. Um, and it's um, you know sad that you know with Steve, the Steve Jobs, his kids are very young, and um, and maybe Apple won't you know will, they won't have a face, so it'll be a little bit more difficult for them. But um, you know, but I'm sure that the team at Apple will do everything they can to try to make sure his legacy continues for many years to come. We don't want to speak ill of those who have just passed, but I'd love for you to comment on that management style of his, and is that. Is that the way to run a business, in your view? Well, Steve, I mean, Steve had a very different kind of management style, um, one that, you know, that I certainly wouldn't recommend, um, but it happened to work um, very extremely well. I mean, he was very autocratic. Um, he was so, so the end justifies the means? Um, the, does the end justify the means? I think. Um, it depends what the means are. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't think, I don't think Steve Jobs was, um, you know, was was cruel or anything like that. He was just, you know, he was he was just, um, you know, he he every all the, he just would not delegate. He every, all the minutiae he wanted to be involved in, and um, and his personality, you know, was was not necessarily, um, you know, a, a great people's person. Um, having said that, you know, he was such a genius that, um, you know, people wanted to work for him and, you know, he managed to get people to work for him and, you know, and, and, and achieved, you know, absolutely remarkable things. I once worked with him. Can um, I, can I, um, I've left my jacket at the back. It's, there's a lot of, okay, can I, could somebody get me my jacket? Can you jacket? You're getting cold? Yeah. Want this one? Do you want no, 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 sorry. I've, I've got a space suit back there. What's that? I've got a space suit. Oh, the space suit will yeah. be good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Air conditioning's good in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Let's, uh, here, let's take a tweet from Dennis London. Uh, looking back on your career, what's the one missed business opportunity uh, that got away, if you will? Um, thank you very much. That's great. Um, the... Sorry, let's make sure the microphone's still yeah. there. Yep. yep. Um, still good to go. I've had numerous things that have got away. Um, but, you know, I had a... Uh, you know, we're lucky enough to, I suppose, be in the position where these things. But I had a friend of mine call me and said he's, he was been he was playing this board board game, and um, that we really should try to get sign the rights for the world outside Canada, and that the rights were available. and um, And I said, well, I can get to Canada on Friday, and he said, well, you know, I would get out there right away if I was you. It's such a it's such a great game, and um, and I thought, well, it was not going to make any difference Friday to Wednesday, and. Anyway, the rights got signed off to somebody else on the Thursday, and, and that was Trivial Pursuits, so that was a, that was, uh. a, that was a bad one. <laughs> um, uh, there was... Um, uh, anyway, there's quite a few. There, there's been a few, but that, I guess that's the nature of the business. Some of them, I guess, will get yeah. away. There's I mean, I think, the, I think the, you know, the interesting thing is that you know, we, you know, we, we're not adverse to trying things, and... Um, and you know we we try a lot of things, and um, and we're not adverse to the falling flat on our face. You know, and and so you know my my own feeling is that you know we just love giving things a go. You know, some things succeed, and if they don't succeed, we we learn we learn from it. Um, you know, there was a time where we, you know, we took on Coca Cola, and we thought you know, we'll knock Coca-Cola into number two position in the world, and one day nobody will have heard of Coca-Cola. Um, and we arrived in Times Square in an Eng English Sherman tank, um, and um, we, we had rigged up the Coca-Cola sign the night before with, with, with pyrotechnics to, um, to explode, or look like it had exploded at the same time that we fired the tank. Um, and. Uh, and the tank fired, the Coca-Cola sign went up. By the way, this was before 9-11 when, when people weren't quite so sensitive about people firing tanks <laughs> in Times Square. Another thing that, <laughs> that would not happen today. I think, I yeah. think it might not have happened today. Um, but anyway, so for about a year, you know, we, 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 you know Virgin Cola was out selling Coca-Cola in the UK. We were having great fun and, and, and our, our troops were rolling out. And then uh, somebody at Coca-Cola woke up to this little brand, and they, um, they just decided to squash us, and they you know, got massive squat teams were sent out around the world, and anywhere that Virgin, Virgin was stocked, suddenly the retailer got a lot of money for destocking us, and, um, and, and um, they, they, they jumped on us. We're still number one in Bangladesh, but... <laughs> <laughs> In certain neighborhoods. <laughs> so uh, well, this is a theme that comes up time and again, uh, given the nature of what you do as, as a small, upstart, cheeky, you know, um, attention-seeking brand. And in the case of the airline, British Airways, in the case of the train lines, it's been the, the government rail system in the UK. Uh, it, it's, it, it's almost, it's predictable. But it's also, it really can be difficult to overcome this David and Goliath challenge. Goliath wins a lot, right? Yeah, I mean, with Coca-Cola, they won. Um, British Airways tried similar, I mean, with British Airways waged a, a really dirty tricks campaign to try to um, put us out of business. And they had put out of business by, by waging similar wars, you know, Dan Air, Air Europe, British Caledonian, Sir Freddie Laker, you know, numerous airlines before us. Um, Freddie Laker, you know, when I sat down with him and, you know, and said, look, you know, you've been driven out of business by BA, you know, I'm starting off with one secondhand 747, you know, do I have any chance of survival? And, and it was he that just said, look, you know, use yourself to get yourself on the front pages of the papers, um, you know, to get that brand, your virgin brand, you're never going to be out, uh, able to out advertise them. Uh, use yourself, make a fool of yourself, do everything you can to get the Virgin brand out there. And then, the only, and then there's three other words I would recommend to you. Uh, sue the bastards. Because um, <laughs> um, he was reluctant to do so, and that hurt him, right? He sued after the event, and he got $10 million. So he retired, you know, retired on his, the $10 million and lived a you know, happy last few years of his life, but would much rather have been running his airlines. So, so when British Airways 
started the Dirty Tricks campaign against us, and, and it, 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 it involved them going through my rubbish bins outside my house to try to find any incriminating evidence against me, going through the rubbish bins of our nightclubs to see if they could find any needles to prove that you know, people might be taking drugs in our nightclubs. I mean, you know, they went to extraordinary lengths. You know, they, they had a, they had a, um, a computer uh, set up where they were illegally accessing our computer information. Um, they were then uh, ringing up our passengers, pretending to be from Virgin, and um, saying that our plane had been cancelled, but um, uh, you know, as a, as a good Virgin employee, we could switch you on to British Airways. Anyway, extraordinary things. And um, we took them to court, and we won the, the biggest da damages ever. And, and, and from that moment, we didn't look back. I mean, you know, British Airways were on the back foot, um, and Virgin you know, grew into a formidable competitor to them. And today, all those people are hackers, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> today, what? I'm just yeah. Saying. Um, a tweet. Uh, how, do you, how do you find the courage to overcome obstacles in life? Um, well, I suppose, I mean, in, in some of my balloon trips, um, I mean, there was one balloon trip where we were crossing the Pacific and we'd lost three quarters of our fuel in, in an electrical fault and we had 7,000 miles still to go and, um, and we calculated that with the fuel left we would have to average 190 miles an hour. Um, the fastest the balloon had ever been was about 80 miles an hour and, uh, and it was incredibly lonely, you know, few, few seconds when that, when that dawned because you know, it was basically we were, we were facing, you know, almost certain death. I mean, it was really almost impossible for us to get out of. No uh, chopper in this case, right? I mean, we, we, the Gulf War had broken out that morning. You know, we were on our own, you know, and, and the Pacific is the, one of the loneliest places out there. There's only Hawaii, and, uh, you know, and that's a little dot in the Pacific. And uh, there was a force eight gale blowing. Um, there's no way that ships would have been able to turn around, and we, were, you know, we, we didn't look good. And um, you know, so you know, I think if I hadn't been trained through my life to confront issues full on and and you know fight, you know, fight to resolve entrepreneurial problems when when there are difficulties, give, you know, do everything I can to try to solve a, solve a, a business problem, you know, work day and night to get it resolved. Um, you know, I may not, I may not have. You know, I may not, I may not have held myself together. So, but you know, but instead, you know, just got into, you know, my my little aircraft seat in the balloon. We 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 carried a British Airways aircraft a seat rather than a Virgin Atlantic seat, so it would keep me awake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, buckle, 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 buckled in and. Um, and then, you know, knew I had three days where I couldn't, you know, if, if, if I was lucky, I had three days where I had to just stay, stay awake, fly, fly the balloon <clears throat> right in the core of the jet stream uh, where the winds were strongest um, and pray that I just could get winds uh, of, you know, anything up near to, to 200 miles an hour. And, you know, I'm not, you know, a, 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 an overtly religious person, but uh, the speedometer started going, you know, 80 miles an hour, 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, 150. Suddenly, we were flying at 220 miles an hour, I mean, right in the core of this jet stream. And, it, you know, it was almost as if somebody had just taken the balloon. And, and, and you know, we, 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 we missed LA, which we were aiming for, um, by 2,500 miles. We ended up in the Arctic. Um, but we, but, we, but, we, but we hit, um, we hit uh, a frozen lake. 700 miles from the nearest road, but we, we hit land, and it was, um, we were very lucky to have survived it. Thank you for the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk about your, your commitment to altruism, which um, predates y your tremendous wealth. Yeah. You were involved uh, in the days of Student Magazine in reaching out to young people uh, with a counseling service, specifically focused on issues uh, surrounding venereal disease and other matters. Matter of fact, that got you in trouble with the law, didn't it? 
It did, yeah. <laughs> um, another one of those rather strange court cases. In fact, bizarrely, I think that they prosecuted under exactly the same, um, the same act, which was the 1889 Indecent Advertisements Act, uh, for mentioning the word venereal disease in public. Oh, terrible. <laughs> um, uh, they, uh, so we had, we had an organization that helped young people with um, various problems, you know, gay, gay, gay community, psychiatric problems, um, and, um, you know, people who are pregnant. And obviously, you know, young people sometimes got venereal disease, and we would try to find the best clinics for them to go to, and it was a fr free help, at, help and advice center. Um, and there was some ancient, ancient act, the 1916 Venereal Diseases Act and 1899 Indecent Votes Act said that it's illegal to mention the word venereal disease. So anyway, the court, the court realized it was a, the, the law was an ass and the register of maudling, the Home Secretary actually wrote me a letter apologizing and they changed the law. So um, now you can mention the word venereal disease and, uh, without getting prosecuted. Well, you, at that time you were, you were struggling to keep a magazine afloat, starting a record shop, moving into the music business. You would be forgiven if you were focused on that. What, what drove you to spend the time you spent on those endeavors, and why do you think that's important? It certainly has blossomed over the years. Well, I was the lad of the 60s, and I think um, it was a time where young teenagers started realizing um, they, they were much better at you know, looking after their fellow human beings, um, you know, if somebody was gay, realizing that, you know, they were, you were born gay, that, you know, they, they, they became, became an accept, accepted in those days. Um, and, you know, there wasn't the prejudices that there, there had been in previous years. And I think the 60s broke down those prejudices. And, um, and, um, and I actually, I think just running that advisory center, you know, taught me a lot about, you know, human beings and, um, and uh, made me, you know, much more understanding and sympathetic of um, people less fortunate than myself. And, um, you know, so I've tried to make sure that, you know, we, we, we run Virgin ethically, that, that we run Virgin as a force for good, that we're not, you know, a money-making machine. We are um, a, a, a group of companies that, um, you know, really go out there and try, try to make a difference in the world. Um, I'm actually putting out a book in two weeks' time called Screw Business as Usual, um, and, you know, which is basically trying to uh, get companies to um, run their companies uh, uh, in a way in which, you know, they're, if they're small companies, you know, they try to tackle lo local issues. If they're bigger companies, they try to tackle national issues. If they're, you know, international companies, they try to tackle global issues. And, they use, use their entrepreneurial skills to tackle these issues. And I think um, if every company can think like that and help the politicians, we can, we, can, we can get on top of most of the major issues in the world. And, um, and, it, and it's great fun trying to do so. Do corporations need more rule breakers, you think? Do they need more? Rule breakers, people that are rule breakers. not confined yeah, I, I do think corporations need more rule breakers, and, and if they're going to get more rule breakers, they've got to be more forgiving of people who make mistakes, which corporations are not very forgiving of people who make mistakes. Are, are, in your companies, are people forgiven for mistakes? I would very much hope so. I mean, you know, I, I, I um, urge our chief executives to do a lot of things, and sometimes I get my way, and sometimes I don't. Um, um, you know, I've been urging them to try to be much more, you know, flexible with our workforces in, you know, in, in, in things like part time and and job sharing, and uh, you know, just trying to, you know, treat treat people in in as you you treat your brothers or your sisters, and treat treat people in a very humane way, um, and. Um, you know, we, we, the people, you know, if, if, I think if, if, for instance, if America were more flexible on, um, on you know, in this room, if they, people were honest, there would be about 20% of people in this room who would actually love it if, their company, if, they, if, their, if they weren't thought bad of at their company to work six months a year rather than 12 months a year. Um, and, you know, it has more time with their children. That, you know, they would earn less money, but they, you know, they, they would, 
they would prefer that. Um, maybe their partner could make up the, make up the difference of that money. But by, by so doing, they would be enjoying the life that they want to enjoy. They would suddenly free up jobs for the 10% of unemployed people in America. You could, you, you could sort out the unemployment problem almost overnight. So, um, you know, so our companies are not perfect in that, in that area. We're, I'm working and trying to push them to become perfect in that area. I would, I would urge all, all companies in America and around the world to you know, be more flexible because I think that, that that's one way where there are la lack of jobs ar around you know, to, to give everybody what they want. I could go for six months off. That'd be nice. Let's, um, let's talk. I want to talk a little more about your altruism and activism, but we have a video I want to play first. We can really make an incredible difference. idea that came about through the staff at Virgin who thought we're great at starting up successful businesses all over the world. Imagine what we could do if we focused all that energy, entrepreneurial talent and our resources into making the world a better place. <laughs> get a whole number of different partners, sometimes with different interests, to come together to make a difference. It's just knowing that someone will be there to catch you when you fall. This group of elders will bring hope and wisdom back into the world. We have been able through their good offices to get $18 million. <laughs> it's really inspiring to see a company pull together like this. Yes, we can. <laughs> Well, just to say, log on to Virgin. <laughs> I felt like I get that right. Get involved. Log on to Virgin. Asante sana. Virgin, unite. <laughs> log on to virginunite.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tell, tell us, uh, that's a fantastic video. You're into a lot of things with Virgin Unite. First of all, how much of your time is now spent on Unite? I think about 80% of my time is now spent on uh, setting up the not-for-profit organizations. Um, you know, we've, the, the businesses run fine, and, um, uh, and I think I get yeah, most of my satisfaction, or more of my satisfaction from these not-for-profits. You were um, recently at a climate change conference in the Maldives, and, uh, or Maldives? Maldives, I guess. And you were quoted as saying, uh, you described climate change as the biggest entrepreneurial opportunity of our lifetime. What do you mean by that? Um, well, uh, I mean, I, I you know, I, um, 
that there's, there's something like 95% of all scientists believe that the world has a major problem. I know there's a lot of skeptics in America, but the, the, but the global warming is reality. But whether, whether global warming is a reality or not, um, the, we, are, we are fast running out of um, fossil fuels. And I think, you know, with China growing at 10% and India growing at 10%, um, South America growing at 8%, and Africa now even growing at 5%, um, the, um, the, the, it, about five years from now, the demand for oil will exceed supply. So, um, you know, fuel prices could go through the roof. So there's lots of reasons why we've got to come up with alternative fuels. And, um, and I just, you know, think there's, there, there, there are enormous opportunities for people to try to come up, uh, you know, to develop alternative fuels and, uh, or, and, and, and save, you know, save energy and, and create new, new forms of energy. And, um, I mean, we, you know, we, we use all the profits from our dirty businesses, our airline businesses, and invest them in trying to develop alternative fuels. And, in fact, last week we announced quite a big breakthrough where... Um, a little company in New Zealand that we're working with has come up with a way of taking all the shit that goes up the chimneys from coal-fired power stations and aluminium plants and steel, steel, steel factories and, and turning it into aviation fuel. Um, so saving 50% you know, carbon output from, from planes. Um, so it's, you know, it's trying to come up with break, breakthroughs like that that I think are very exciting. All right, this conversation is great. We're going to bring a couple other guests into the mix. But before I bring them up here, can I have a rod? Because I, certainly I think you need a little help publicizing your endeavors. What do you think? Can you have a what? A ride on Galactic. I, a ride? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Have you, do, um, do, you have the, do you have a check? <laughs> <laughs> All right, a couple of guys in the wings who would like to ask a few questions as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage McAfee's co-presidents, Michael DeCesar and Todd Gebhardt. Come on out. Yeah, right Thank you. Nice to All right. Good job. Todd, Todd, why don't you begin it? Yeah, I know you have a couple questions. Sir. <clears throat> yeah, I'd be happy to. I'm sure I'm only one of a few people that have said to you what an amazing person, amazing life you've had. You've built so many companies, so many different identities around the Virgin brand. You told us how you came up with the name. When, when you hear the word Virgin, what do you want us to think? What do you want us to think about that brand? And then how do you go about protecting it? Um, well, the, how you go about protecting it is a really, really good question. I mean, the, the, um, I mean, we like to think that the Virgin brand is synonymous with, you know, with quality, with good value, with um, fun, with innovation, um, and you know, and and you know, we won't go into a new a new business unless we feel it is it, it's, it's going to have all those attributes and it's going to actually enhance all the other the Virgin brands that have come before it. Um, how do you protect it? Um, uh, you know, we, 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 we try to make sure that, um, you know, we run, we run our company ethically, um, that we don't make any moves where, you know, if, if we're going to wake up and, you know, if we, if we make a move that, you know, that we'll be embarrassed about if we read about it in a newspaper, we, you know, we just won't do it. So, um, and... You know, we, we imbue that in, in all the managing directors around the world. Um, and, you know, there will be mistakes. Um, and I think the brand is big enough to, you know, to cope with, you know, the occasional mistakes as long as, you know, we, as long as we move incredibly quickly and we admit, admit there's a mistake. I mean, the, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in the, you know, we're, we're in the uh, transportation business. I mean, thank God. You know, in, in 28 years, we've never had a, a, an airline accident. Um, you know, we, we had a train crash, um, which was actually no fault of our own, but, you know, the, some of the track, which we, we didn't control, was, was loose. Um, I was on a skiing holiday. Um, you know, I made absolutely certain that, you know, that, um, you know, I found a plane that got me to the accident, you know, within, you know, two and a half hours of the accident. Um, you know, to meet the passengers, to, you know, to go to the hospital, um, you know, to confront it, confront it head on. And, um, you know, so how you manage, you know, a difficult situation like that, you know, I mean, I even had to, you know, there was one person killed in the accident, 
you know, I had to go to the morgue to comfort, you know, comfort the relatives. And, you know, so, and, and, and I think, you know, people appreciated the fact that when I, I'd taken that trouble. So, you know, so confronting head on a problem like that is, is, is very important, I think. Michael? My turn. So you made your first uh, fortune in the music business. The artists these days deal with digital rights management and the fact that it's so easy to download music and copy it to multiple devices. How, how do you see the music industry evolving as a result of that? Um, it's funny because when, when we were, uh, when we had our record shops and our record label and, and I decided to go into the airline business, the, um, the critics, you know, really criticized me for, you know, they said, you know, the, 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 everything you're taught at a business school says stick with what you, stick with your onions, you know, don't, don't diversify, you know, out of what you know. Um, and anyway, we did, and we carried on diversifying. But if we, if we had actually stuck with our original business, um, Steve Jobs effectively would have put us out of business when, with, 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 with the iPod and, and, and obviously the internet, because the music business, for, you know, is pretty well dead as far as, um, you know, I mean, re retail shops are, are pretty well all, all gone. Um, uh, record labels are, are on their last feet. Um, you know, live music will, 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 will last forever, and you know, Virgin puts on some, you know, I think quite fun live concerts. Um, music will never die, um, but you know, pe you know, people are not going to make the same kind of money out of it that um, you know, they used to you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, and then, and also now, there's just so much more choice for young people. I mean, it, you know, when I was young, music was really everything, you know, to, to um, a young person. Um, now you've got, you know, video games, you've got the money you spend on your telephones, your, your mobile phones, your, you know, there's, there's just, there's just a lot more, a lot more choice. So, so I think, um, you know, it, um, you just have to accept that life evolves and go, go with the flow. Hey, Todd? Back to me. Yeah. The fire at Necker Island. You had a lot of valuable information there, photos, notebooks, other information, so forth. Did you have it backed up? Did you learn something about security after the fire there? I wonder why you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think I might give you the answer that you need. Um, uh, yes, we did have it backed up. Um, uh, but the backup tapes, it just so happened, uh, were in the house itself. Oh. Um, so we should have gone to a decent company to, 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 to have uh, advised us better. Um, I think, um, you know, I was standing, uh, you know, with Kate Winslet's kids um, just, just after they'd been rescued from the house. And, you know, we were standing 100 yards away in, in another building watching uh, these 200 foot flames. Um, uh, and you know the 90 mile an hour winds and the pouring rain and just looking looking up there and you know and I just said to the kids you know uh, you know none of these things really matter you know the, the, everything that's gone up in there is just stuff and um, and you know just thank God everybody's safe and you do realise in the end that um, you know obviously you you need you need to back up things from a business point of view and it's stupid not to do it properly. Um, but, uh, you know, but in the, in the end, you know, photographs, notebooks, diaries, uh, you know, even photo albums, they're lovely things to have, but, um, but um, as long as everybody's well and healthy, not that important. No doubt family is the important thing, but we'll be there to help you on the next one. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, yeah, we'd be delighted to get some advice off you. Thank you. Absolutely. Final question, Michael. So you mentioned that our kids could potentially be in a position where they might be able to choose space travel as a normal, as a normal vacation. For the folks in this room, when, when the first passengers go up, what will the experience be like? How long will it take to get there? Will they be in a big space? What will they do when they get up there? Can you just describe what the, what the experience is going to be like? Well, our initial flights um, a suborbital flights, and then in future years we'll do orbital flights. So the, the, the um, initial flights, you will arrive at the spaceport, um, you will climb ab aboard the, 
spaceship, which will be attached to the mothership. Um, uh, and um, you'll be flown up to 60,000 feet. Um, the spaceship will then drop away from the mothership. Um, by the way, you'll be strapped in at this stage. <laughs> uh, and uh, the rocket will fire. Um, you'll go from uh, naught to 3,000 miles an hour in eight seconds. So you'll be on, on for the ride of a lifetime <laughs> as, you, as you head off into space. Giant windows um, to look out of. And um, when you reach space, um, your sort of Virgin Fonda, uh, sorry, Jane Fonda, uh, Barbarella type of air host stewardess will, be, will, ask, will help you un <laughs> un unbuckle your seats. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, um, and you'll be able to you know, uh, experience weightlessness. You'll be able to look back at the Earth uh, in all its majestic, majesty. And, um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and you'll become an astronaut and, um, and, and, and just enjoy an incredible journey. And um, when you're ready to go back to Earth again, um, you will obviously buckle back in again. And, and, and the great advantage over the Virgin Galactic spaceship over a NASA spaceship is um, that it, it, instead of a NASA spaceship had to hit the, Earth, hit the Earth's atmosphere just at the right angle, otherwise it would burn up. With the Virgin Galactic spaceship, it effectively turns into a giant shuttlecock. And <laughs> you come in, you know, the pilots could be sound asleep. You come in as a giant shuttlecock uh, in, through, through, through back into the Earth's atmosphere. Um, at about four or five times the speed of sound, but um, but slowed up enough so there's no danger of burning up. Um, but come back into a spaceship form uh, when you come back in and come back down again, and um, hopefully have had a ride of a lifetime. And um, and I just want to say thanks very much for it. it's been it's been a um, he's 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 great to talk to. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank we're, you very much. Right Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, it was a pleasure. What a great way to kick off Focus 11. This was fantastic. Great conversation. We certainly could go on, but we have a, a show to put on. And uh, so please give Sir Richard a round of applause. Dave Milam will come up. Thank you. Pleasure. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Pleasure. Thank Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank you very much. We really you. appreciate it. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good. Excuse me. All right. All right, thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>